The first full-length trailer for Avatar The Way of Water has dropped, and there are elements and details to discuss before our return to Pandora in theaters on December 16th. In director James Cameron's first adventure to Pandora, we spent time on land, in the air, and, well, floating on land in the air. This time around, it's obviously no secret that we'll be spending a good chunk of time underwater. I mean, it's right there in the title. And the trailer wastes no time in showing the Na'vi taking a dive. Of course, James Cameron is no stranger to water-themed adventures. His biggest hydro hits took place on the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, where Jack and Rose, played by Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, fought to keep love afloat in the 1997 tear-jerker actioner Titanic. Eight years before that, he took us into the mysterious dark depths of the Bahamas to uncover the secrets of the abyss. And even eight years before that, he helped bring the terrors of the deep to the surface with the uh, critically questionable Piranha 2 The Spawning. It just goes to show everybody starts somewhere, even the masters. And just take a look at the visuals Cameron and his team are now capable of. The waters of Pandora are teeming with breathtaking visual wonders. Some of the sea life even conjures up some of the same designs and themes we were introduced to in the first movie. Like that colorful winged sea creature with intimidating pincers in the foreground. It calls to mind the flying Ekron from the first movie. And check out that sideways, translucent, stingray jellyfish thingy. So cool. But who are the Navi we see in the water amongst the sea life? Is that Natiri played by Zoe Saldana? Of course, there's the 20th Century Studios logo. The fox was dropped off the logo when Disney acquired Fox back in 2019. Lightstorm Entertainment is Cameron's independent production company that he founded with Lawrence Kasanoff back in 1990. Lightstorm was responsible for The Abyss Special Edition, Terminator 2, True Lies, Titanic, and the first Avatar, amongst other amazing films. With such big moneymakers under its umbrella, it's no wonder James Cameron has afforded himself 13 years between the first Avatar and its sequel, with three more Avatar movies slated through 2028. Now that's Nathiti for sure. We recognize her iconic pull of a bow from the first movie, but there's something a little different this time around. It appears she's a little off balance thanks to a Navi baby in the making. Is that Jake Sully's baby? How is that possible? Can an avatar help conceive a full Navi baby? I have a lot of questions, some of which might not be so appropriate for this video, so moving on. Blam! James Cameron! Next, we see we're back in the jungles of Pandora. Remember those fan lizards from the first movie? They light up at night, and the Navi call them Kenton. Finally, we're treated to our first line of dialogue. Dad, I know you think I'm crazy. Who delivers this line? A quick push of the closed captioning will reveal the character's name is Kiri, played by what the French toast Sigourney Weaver? Dr. Grace Augustine? So, wait, is she voicing a brand new character? Is Kitty some sort of partial life force of Augustine from the Tree of Souls? Either way, Weaver's performance will most certainly elevate the film. Mind-blowing! What's next? It looks like Jake Sully, played by Sam Worthington, is teaching another young Navi to hunt. You remember how to tell it's Jake? Take a look at his left hand, which is holding the young Navi's elbow up as they take aim. Five fingers. Navi only have four. Kitty finishes her thought, saying, But I feel her. We see a shot of the Tree of Souls. Is this the same tree? A new one? Is it possible Kiri is talking about Ewa, the Navi's all-mother deity? Or, oh no, is Kiri Jake and Natiri's daughter? Does something happen to Natiri? The implications could be very dramatic, to be sure. We see another young Navi, possibly male, playing with the awesomely detailed plant life. Then Kiri continues with her I hear her heartbeat. Just as we see a tokarina, or seeds from the sacred tree descend on whom we can only assume is Kiri, asleep in the grass. They descend upon her like they did Jake in the first movie, just before… BAM! Cut to the Ekron! Yes, there they are! By the way, any of you gamers out there get Panzer Dragoon vibes from the Ekron, or is it just me? Kiri continues, she's so close. Before we get to another underwater shot of Pandora's equivalent of a whale, is that Jake going to touch its fin? One, two, three, four, five. Yep. Next, we feast on the beauty of what looks like an extreme form of neon tetra fish, and just beyond them are blue feet dipped in the water. Do I spy five toes? Kiri is sitting with Jake having a heart to heart. This scene is obviously the basis for all the dialogue we've heard up to now. Jake asks her what her heartbeat sounds like before we see a glorious underwater shot that borders on the celestial. Is Ewa forming another landmark for the Navi to commune with? In the depths of Pandora's oceans? We see Kiri connect to it with her tail before we hear her answer, mighty. As if all our senses weren't already overloaded, 
Buckle up for a barrage of visuals. Pandora's life forms of land, sea, and air collide in a frenzy of activity, and the Navi come to some sort of rock formation that seems like an ancient monument. Does its significance have anything to do with the orbits of other celestial formations? Just beyond its broken round curvature, we see either a planet or a moon, and a sun peeking out behind that. Also, notice how there are rock formations that seem to be floating? Are we back at the Hallelujah Mountains, aka the legendary floating mountains of Pandora? Next, we see the Nafi riding some sort of… well, if Ikron can't swim, then those are some kind of sea-dwelling creatures that like to leap out of the water. How cool! But things are about to take a serious turn in the next shot. Bam! Fire! And our first view of anything mechanical. To the left, there seems to be a soldier in a stripped-down version of an amp suit, like the one Stephen Lang's Colonel Quatrich used to fight Jake in the first movie. To the right, is that Jake in military gear or maybe another avatar? I think I see five toes. What do you think? The next shot appears to be Jake's head slowly ascending over the surface of the water. If this shot looks familiar to you, you're not alone. It feels like an iconic shot from the classic war film Apocalypse Now, when Martin Sheen's Captain Willard surfaces from the muck to assassinate Colonel Kurtz, played by acting legend Marlon Brando. If that wasn't enough of an Apocalypse Now reference for you, check out the next shot, where Jake and Natiri watch as yet another jungle of Pandora is set aflame, not unlike the napalm-filmed opening credits of Francis Ford Coppola's masterpiece. So it appears the human element has returned to Pandora. If that avatar wincing with the skull in his hand is Jake, it just goes to show how fully he turned his back on his kind. But crushing skulls? Where have I seen that before? Well, for James Cameron fans, a crushed skull is a signature of the director's Terminator films. In Terminator, we see skulls rolled over by the HK tank. HK stands for Hunter Killer, by the way. And in Terminator 2, a T-800 robot stomps a skull after Sarah Connor's opening monologue, voiced by Linda Hamilton. As we see a shot of human forces being airlifted out, a new voice emerges. We cannot let you bring your war here. The dialogue is credited to a character named Tonawati the leader of another tribe of Navi. A quick look at IMDb shows that Tonawati is played by Cliff Curtis, a distinguished character actor you might remember from such films as The Meg, Training Day, Blow, and the AMC series Fear the Walking Dead. What the what? Browsing through the cast list, another character seems to have returned from the dead. The intense Stephen Lang is back as Quaritch? How? Well, it's safe to say that Tonawati has every right to be concerned for his people. Whatever shores Jake has brought his people to, notice how the Navi there are a different color? They're more of a sea green than what we've come to know. And judging by their wardrobe, they have a deeper relationship with the water. Check out the interesting shells and scales they wear. The next voice we hear belongs to Loak, played by Britton Dalton. There's an actor credited with the part of young Loak, Chloe Coleman. So does this mean there's a large time shift in the film? Anyway, he says that he's seen as an outcast and it's obvious that he endures some bullying. But one character says she sees him, Sereya, played by Bailey Bass. It's pretty wild to think that the Navi we've come to know and love would have a hard time fitting in on their own planet. But hey, who of us hasn't felt out of place once or twice right here on Earth? Something tells me that's precisely what Cameron is getting at. More breathtaking landscapes and life forms follow as Loak says, the way of water connects all things. In one night shot on the water, it appears there are five members to Jake and Natiri's family if this is in fact a shot of their family unit. So who is that on the far right? Next, we see a war-battered Jake embraced by Tonawati. Whatever Jake did, he obviously proved himself. That moment is interrupted by some kind of large hydroplane looking to bring the hurt. It's carrying some more mechanized vehicles inside on the left, probably submersible. They'll be fighting this new Navi tribe, who seem to have their own species of Ekron as well. They look more like dragonflies, heavy on the dragon. Look at that snout and those teeth! Yikes! Loak continues saying, before your birth, which leads to an astounding shot of a young Navi child whose head is just above the surface, breathing. It looks like maybe the eye of an Ekron is watching the child. Is this a brand new Navi baby? Are they born larger and more mature than human children? Loak finishes with, and after your death, to visions of fiery destruction on a shore filled with Navi. It appears there's a dead Ekron or sea animal in the foreground. Oof, this movie is going to be intense. To support my point, this next sequence shows the Navi swimming for their lives only to be caught between two submersible combat vehicles. Take a look at that last one. It looks a lot like the submersible James Cameron's cast of characters used to navigate the ocean floor in the abyss. Natiri brings her own fire as she yells, this is our home. 
and we see her and Jake navigating some sort of upside-down sinking base or ship, bringing to mind shades of Titanic, when Jack and Rose race to escape the rising water as it fills the giant ship. Natiri helped train Jake in the ways of the Navi, so seeing Jake pleading for her to be so strong amidst all the destruction is jarring. If at some point she were to leave Jake's side for any reason, it would certainly raise the stakes and drama of the storyline. This next shot shows Kiri and two other Navi underwater next to some sort of glowing root. Maybe this really is a sacred landmark connected to Ewa. But also look at Kiri's hands. I guess this answers my earlier question. Those ten digits truly mark her as a mix of human and Navi. Whether what happens next is conjured by her actions or just a creative cut, the scale of that magnificent whale-like creature about to land on whatever that platform is sure puts Free Willy to shame. But rewind this sequence back and let's take a look at the characters on the platform. It's becoming increasingly apparent that the military are using a mix of soldier personnel as well as avatars. This can't be good, especially if Quaritch is back. Could he possibly be inhabiting one of those avatars? I guess we'll have to find out on December 16th. But real quick, look on the right side of the platform. It looks like there are two Navi who seem to be taken prisoner. If Quaritch is involved and they're part of Jake's family, things are going to get real personal. A few more shots of the Navi in flight battle mode, and then we're back to Netiri and Jake. He calls her strong heart, and she takes up her bow. Mighty indeed. Then the music swells for our final title and credit screens. I think it's safe to say the filmmakers worked very hard to keep the continuing story of Avatar under wraps, and that work paid off. I might have more questions than answers at the end of that trailer, and some of my questions, I'm not sure I'm ready for their answers. But one thing's for sure, all will be revealed on December 16th. It's going to be awesome, and only in theaters. Until then, is there anything you caught in the trailer that we missed? Let us know in the comments. I hope you liked this video and found some cool new details you missed in the Avatar The Way of Water trailer. Make sure to subscribe to Movie Logic for more daily movie trivia secrets and Easter eggs.